moment for tonight is this gentleman here, Paul Beaver, who I've known for 30 odd years. Um, Paul's got a long and distinguished CV of writing, editing, publishing, Sky Pundit on aviation, God knows what. Um, but importantly, uh, over the last few years, he did have uh, close personal access to Winkle and is working on Winkle's uh, biography. The official, the authorised, but maybe not entirely loved by Winkle biography when it finally comes out. But he's going to tell you a bit about that. So, ladies and gentlemen, Paul's going to talk for 40, 45 minutes, then we'll break for refreshments, uh, and then any questions after. And I think Paul said there are some books somewhere that he would be delighted to sell and sign for you if you have any cash left over uh, later in the evening. Ladies and gentlemen, hands together please for Paul B. Thank you, Graham. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. I've had a cold. I have a cold, so I'm afraid snogging is out uh, this evening. Um, and, and occasionally I'm going to run over and, and take a hot drink. Um, what I thought I'd do is take you through what I've found out about jets and Winkle. I mean, it sounds like a pop group from the 60s, Winkle and the Jets. Um, but he absolutely um, adored Jets, because Jets had two things going for him in, in his early flying career. The first was, they were, uh, they, he, he was unique in flying Jets. Winkle liked to be unique. And the second is, they were fast, and he liked fast things. He got his last speeding ticket when he was 94 years old, okay? <laughs> just to give you an indication. And we, um, we, his son and I convinced him um, uh, when he was 95 to take the car away uh, from him. Um, it, it didn't actually work, he did go out driving uh, again afterwards, but he was really not quite uh, up to it, but I have to say he did survive um, a car accident which the police said would have been killed anybody else because he knew how to survive. He saw this thing coming and he was able to, he shifted from the driver's compartment to the passenger's compartment and the driver's compartment was completely destroyed but not the passenger compartment and he was curled up uh, in the bottom. Here is a man who knew how to survive. He also knew a little bit about flying. So let's, um, let's just, just have a quick look. So what do we know about him? Well, we know he was born on the 21st of January 1919, or thereabouts, okay? Um, there are two versions of his age when it comes to official records. Um, there's what his passport and the Navy 206 says and what he used to say. But we do know he joined the Royal Navy in December 1939. He went to St. Vincent. So he went up through the the training program and became selected for a fighter pilot in 1940 and came here just after the air station opened um, and had a really interesting time here. He was reduced in rank uh, or he had three months seniority taken off him for an incident with a gladiator um, and he was the subject of an in-service board of inquiry about um, a hurricane um, to which he um, did incur their Lordship's displeasure, which is in his 206. I love this. You know, he incurred their Lordship's displeasure. In other words, they gave him a bollocking. Um, and I find that really interesting because by January 1944, he was Chief Naval Test Pilot. And a number of other things as well. He eventually became boss of the Aerodynamics Flight. He was a member of the Jet Flight. Um, he was indoctrinated. Um, by August 1944 into jet technology, something that was um, not a, a quite at the most secret of enigma, but pretty close to that. Um, as you're probably aware, we didn't have a uniformed secrecy coding of restricted, confidential, secret, top secret, um, as we had until just recently. Um, that didn't come into 1956. Uh, when Churchill wrote memos, they were strictly private and confidential which today we would probably say were top secret. Um, but that was the day when gentlemen would not divulge anything that they were told not to. And I don't know how many of you here have got secrets, I suggest quite a few. 
but certainly my father, until his, on his deathbed, would not talk about what he did because somebody had said to him, don't talk about it. And that's what they did. Eric, on the other hand, thank goodness, left huge volumes of information. Twelve sea chests full of letters. He kept a copy of every letter he wrote and every letter he received. And one of the wonderful things um, when, when I got this after he died was to go through and see my letters to him um, in 1978 um, and his replies all carefully filed, filed away. So I've still got those um, and they are uh, they're fantastic. So that's Winkle the Man. And this is the first jet he encountered. You've all read, I'm sure, in Wings on My Sleeve um, how this, this happened. And I think I have to probably stand still or as I get into the interference zone of the speakers. Um, I don't like standing still, so it's a lot easier if you, I can dodge the tomatoes in the frame. Um, this was a really interesting um, uh, time for Winkle. Winkle's career is full of serendipity and opportunity. So you're flying down from Donnybristle to Croydon to have um, shoulder straps fitted in your martlet. The reason being, he'd had an accident and taken a chunk out of the side of his face. He'd had a, a fire um, about six months beforehand in a hurricane and had a nasty burn and he hit the gun sight of the martlet, um, at which helped not a lot in the, uh, in, in the process. So each aircraft was taken down to Royston um, Aviation at Croydon um, to have lap straps. He diverted into Cram uh, to Cranwell because of the weather, um, and he was a Navy pilot, so he understood weather. He went um, and uh, went overnight, you all know the story about with five ten bone, etc. Um, the, the fascinating thing to me about this was that he was asked to go and do the MET test the next day, the next day being the 15th of, of May, and did the usual 2,000, 4,000, 6,000, um, uh, where's the cloud, where's the wind? And when he landed and reported the SATCO, the SATCO said, great, thank you for that, go and stand at the back of the town, the VCR, the town, and don't say anything. And of course, there and behold, a, a hangar door opens, and out comes this aeroplane. And it's just one of those remarkable serendipity things. Serendipity because he was the last person to fly it in February 1945, before it was scrapped. He was the last person to take it airborne. Took it airborne for about 30 minutes. Um, in, in a period of what, uh, four years, three and a half years, he'd gone, it, it had gone from being top secret into an aircraft that had so it gone. It, it had done everything it needed to do. Um, and Eric, who loved putting aeroplanes into his logbook, you know, 487 types, no wonder. And only the aircraft that he was pilot in command of uh, are in the logbook. And only the flights that were authorised. He made a big thing about this, and we'll come to that in a minute, because there was there were some unauthorised flying bits um, uh, in his life. Um, Eric, as a young sub lieutenant, um, was a, um, a bit of a lad. He and his mate Fletcher, who sadly died on the Audacity, and got into a lot of trouble, as all sub lieutenants do in the fleet era. It's standard, it's the same with young pilot officers in the Royal Air Force or second lieutenants in the Army Air Corps you're always going to, to get into a little bit of trouble. When you think about it afterwards, and you think that he was station commander at, uh, at Lossiemouth, you know, and there he was, the governance and the authority and all of that, to think back that just 30 years before, he'd been a bit of a chap. And I think that makes him even more lovable um, uh, than, than, uh, than before. His real time with Jets was the Farron mission. <laughs> Um, this was something that Churchill had thought up um, in about August 1943, when he decided that we were going to win the war. And we were going to win the war, we needed to win the peace. So the Germans we knew were ahead of us. I mean, the amount of intelligence we had about what the Germans were doing with their 
uh, supersonic wind tunnels with their jet engine work, but particularly on, uh, on the Arado 262 and the 162, which, all of which he ended up flying, um, all of which were, in their own way, uh, world leaders and way ahead of where we were. Uh, he, Churchill decided that we needed to have a team that went out and he would put it under the control of the director up to, uh, at Farnborough, called Farron. And what they would do is, <coughs> there's even a, a piece of, of paper I found in the National Archives, which is the legal um, view of the Attorney General as to why looting Germany at the end of the war would be legal. And the, the rationale is fabulous. It's, it's in a nutshell, it's because we need it, because we've expended all our gold and lots and lots of our treasure and lots of blood, we need something back. We're not going to make the mistakes of 1919 in Versailles, but we need something back. And we want to take a lead. We certainly don't want the Soviets to have it. We don't want the French to have it. But most importantly, we don't want the Americans to have it. And so therefore, Farron mission, off you go. He drew up a list of 12 people that he wanted uh, to interview and to find. He managed 10 of those people, but we'll come to that in a minute. Um, the uh, Arado 234, I think it's a fabulous aeroplane. Um, and to sum up Winkle's view of it, it's a unique design that puts the pilot right in the center of the crash when it happens, because it's going to. Um, and you may not know that that was the last aircraft to fly over Britain, last Luftwaffe aircraft to fly over Britain, not the actual one, but the 234B was the last um, aircraft. And it was, contrary to anything you read about D-Day, it was active on D-Day. If it was all the stuff about the Germans saying they didn't have nothing showed up over the beaches, it's because we couldn't see it. It was so high. But they were operating out of Juvencourt, which is just north of Rance, and they were escorted by 262s uh, up to um, uh, the area around Falaise, and then they went over and photographed the beaches and with all the, 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 uh, the landing craft, etc. And we couldn't see them, and there was no way we would have intercepted them. Um, so a really interesting airplane. And of course the Swallow, um, the, the ME 262, uh, Eric felt was the best aircraft in the Second World War in terms of taking aviation forward. Um, the sweat wing, the, the, the jet engine. And, and a really good cockpit. He liked the cockpit layout. He liked German cockpit layouts because the Germans are pragmatic people. And the engineering is really good. Now, unfortunately for us, we usually allow the engineers to design the cockpits. The Germans had their test pilots who were all qualified engineers and got them to design the, top, the, the cockpits. So um, this wasn't a, 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 there was a called a Messerschmitt, it was actually designed by Lippisch. And he had got a couple of Luftwaffe pilots to say where the best places to have things like the throttle were. So any of you who know about the Spitfire, will know that there's a really ridiculous thing. You have to change hands. I'm lucky enough to have a bit fast. You have to change hands uh, immediately after take off, get the flaps up and get the wheels up, and keep your hand on the throttle at the same time, which is why all, even the Philodels of this world, do this on, 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 on takeoff. You don't get that with the German airplane. You certainly don't get it with a jet. But this is the one that got away. This is the one we knew about. We had good, um, uh, air intelligence about it, um, mainly through, through MI6 Secret Intelligence Service, had people in the right places, but they had a great network um, in France and Austria and Germany, not so much in Belgium and, and the Netherlands, that had been compromised quite early, but in the factories there were a good number of people who actually knew about um, these aircraft and knew what was, what was going on. This, this is the Horton Flying Wing aircraft. One of the lovely things about Eric, I think, is that he didn't care that the Hortons were paid up members of the party, had SS uniforms. He knew they were really bright people. He wanted to get to talk to them. He wanted to find this. The Americans got to it first, which is why the Americans have the B-2 stealth bomber, which is, this is its grandfather, uh, if you like. Um, a lot of work was done in trying to do deals 
with the Americans uh, on this. One of the things that Eric was really good at, as remember at this stage, he was a lieutenant. He was actually a temporary acting lieutenant, okay, when he was leading this this mission. So that's that's getting you know that's getting pretty low down uh, the scale. Um, he would do deals with the Americans. The Americans had a bird colonel, full colonel, running their operation, Watson. What he would do with them is, we had, for example, 17 Arado 234s. The Americans had none. If you want to have an hour interrogating Goering, what's the price? The price is a 234. Okay. So, if I give you two, can I have two hours with him? Or can I have an hour with him and an hour with the Lippitches or, or something? And those are the deals that were being done. Unauthorized, Eric did quite a lot of self-authorization, as you might say, uh, and that was one of them. He tried to find the, 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 uh, the horns, didn't get there uh, in the end, but did get to talk to their sister, who was the chief the deputy chief aerodynamicist, and she was 20, and she'd already got a PhD from Heidelberg. She died two years ago, um, and um, I'm quite chuffed by the fact that on her desk, the last thing she wrote was a letter to me um, saying what she thought about, uh, about Winkle, why uh, he was important, why the Germans respected him because he respected their engineers. It's a really nice, uh, a nice uh, uh, piece to, uh, to have. Um, so he didn't get uh, to do that. He didn't even get to see it until he went to the States in the 1970s. Um, so this is really the one that got away. One of the things that the Navy was really keen on, it wanted to adopt the jet era. It wanted to get jets on carriers. It wanted to do it before the Americans, and it wanted to exploit some of the developments that we had. Um, Dennis Campbell's angled deck, um, the, the mirror landing site, the steam, um, the um, uh, hydraulic um, uh, arrest wires, um, all of those things that we were developing for the carriers, for jets, because it was going to be, it was very obvious, and I hope that, yeah, if you are sitting there, and you go, or for that matter, there or there, and you go through the barrier because you've missed um, uh, the wires, it's not going to be a very pleasant experience. The wire, the barriers are made of steel. Um, so you're going to get a, a crushed pilot, um, whereas if you go through in a sea fury, um, the engine is going to take uh, the, the brunt of it. So the work was being done, um, at the same time as getting a jet on, was to get the, the aircraft carrier uh, uh, format sorted out. So Eric was given a free hand to choose a jet aeroplane. He was given a free hand to decide which aircraft uh, would go uh, on the deck. And he flew all three of these. Um, basically, um, uh, the Gloucester aircraft was just not going to uh, be able to do it. It was not going to have, um, it took five seconds for the engine to spool up if you advance the throttle. Five seconds when you're on the approach and you're low uh, is, means you're going to fly into the back of the carrier. Um, the Meteor was not mature enough at that stage to do it and you had, you had the issue that a lot of the problems with the aircraft was that you were having um, uh, asymmetric uh, problems with the aircraft and at this stage they didn't want any of that. They really wanted a single engine. And that's the American um, uh, aircraft, the Bell aircraft, that uh, they were looking at, at using. And uh, that, that engine was even worse uh, than uh, the original whistle uh, engine in terms of spooling up. So the choice was the spider crab. Now we might call that the vampire. Um, uh, in all of Winkle's early work in his old books, for example, it's called the spider crab because the spider crab is what everybody knew it as. Um, I've no idea if somebody thought it looked like a spider crab. I don't particularly uh, 
uh, think that it did. But um, what, what's really interesting is that there's a really good series of photographs. There's also huge controversy about that approach to the deck and using all the spoilers um, to get onto the deck. That's the aircraft taking off, and that's getting onto the deck. Um, did he really need to dump that much lift and, and dump or crash onto the, onto, the, um, onto the deck? And one of the things he said in his report afterwards is, and this is very winkle, the average fleet air arm pilot will not be able to manage a jet landing on a carrier. So we shouldn't be going in this direction. Only exceptional pilots can cope with this. Which meant the fleet arm ordered 650 Sea Furies. And it was a good job that it did, because Korea came along, and we wouldn't have had anything that was capable of operating over Korea. So it wasn't perhaps as bad as it might seem. Um, but there's the first pure jet landing, you might say the first turbo jet landing uh, on the carrier. And you all know, I'm sure, uh, the story uh, that uh, Eric was determined to do it. Um, the weather was wrong, the weather was bad, um, they wanted to postpone it, but Eric didn't. He was so worried the Americans would get there before him. Um, so uh, he plonked the aircraft down uh, onto the deck, having done a fly pass, which got everyone out of the wardroom uh, when they realised, because you know, the noise of a jet is just so, at this time, is just so unusual. So everyone on deck, up go the wires, um, you're probably aware that on flight deck, when you're not using the flight deck, the wires go down. Um, up came the wires, up, out gets the batsman in his rather smart um, Irving jacket, um, and uh, Eric uh, lands on, uh, and uh, a history is made. There's some wonderful pieces that I've got. One of the things is that he had a little box of his most cherished possessions. Um, his first aviator certificate from the Royal Aero Club um, and two letters from his wife and one of them is the letter she wrote to him they were staying overnight in Arundel the aircraft was operating out of Ford um, and uh, it's a letter to him saying you're going to make history today it's the most poignant love letter historically interesting uh, I think of, of, of that period it is absolutely fabulous um, and he had that in his, uh, in his flying suit because she said you must only open it when you're sitting at the end of the runway before you take off and do it. And it's, and it's great because the envelope still, it's still got the envelope, it's got you know, the war temporary sticker on it, it's a reused envelope. How many of us have our grandparents or parents reused envelope after envelope? My mother um, would never throw an envelope away. That was always reusable because that's what you did. Uh, in the war, and it was the same uh, with this. So this was a momentous occasion for Eric, and a momentous occasion um, uh, for the Royal Navy as well. It gave the Royal Navy um, a lead over the Americans. And, and quite frankly, in 1945, uh, the Atlee administration was looking at trying to recover the economic situation. We had spent all our gold. We were bankrupt by the end of September 1940. The very last pieces of gold from South Africa, from Simonstown, were put in a cruiser and taken to America. So America before, and we all go, hey Lisa, how wonderful. Just remember, just remember that America made sure we were completely bankrupt before it stepped in to help us with Lendis and take the Virgin Islands and the bases in Bermuda and, and whatever. So special relationship works, should work both ways, I'm not sure it necessarily does. Um, and they really were pissed off about, sorry, they were really, really upset about this. Which is good. And he did eventually take uh, the meteor to the deck. Um, he also flew the first uh, turboprop aircraft, which was a derman powered uh, meteor. His view of the meteor was pretty much like, there might be some of you here have flown the meteor, um, perhaps in training or Friday or whatever. Um, this is an aeroplane you don't want to abandon by use of an injection seat unless you don't want to use your head on the way down. Um, he had a pretty poor view 
um, of the aircraft until it got to the later models. Um, so that uh, uh, he flew um, probably about four different variants of, of Meteor. Difficult to be absolutely precise because like many pilots, the actual mark number is not recorded in, in, uh, in this uh, flying model. You can get to it via the serial number, but it just takes, uh, takes a bit of doing. So it isn't until February 48 he gets another first. This is not in Guinness Book of Records. I think it really is just as important as the twin engine aircraft as the Mosquito landing on the deck in 44 in terms of where it took the Americans. Because at this time, we were giving all of our data to the US Navy. It was all part of the arrangement. We were going to get stuff back. We are still waiting for that. If anyone here is American, could you please ask your senators if we could have that, uh, uh, that data you promised us uh, back. But by this stage, the one significant thing here is, you notice where the DCLO, Deck Landing Control Officer, the batsman is. Um, there's no longer the, um, the, the mosquito. Have you seen the pictures of the mosquito landing on Indefatigable? Yeah. You've seen the batsman out in the middle of, it's called Bob Everett. He, was a, he wanted to be an actor. Yeah. He wanted to be a dancer. And the way he does his batting, it's absolutely fabulous. The whole series of photographs of this guy, right in the middle of the flight deck. Um, they, uh, they weren't going to do quite the same uh, with the meteor. Uh, and that's a pretty brave act, taking that aircraft in. Remembering that this aircraft's engines took three seconds to spool up on the approach. And you all know probably that the Mosquito um, landed below the stall speed of the aircraft because it couldn't go at the stall speed because that would have ripped the, the arresto hook out of the tail of the aircraft, which happened on the eighth flight, the arresto hook broke. So there is a lot of courage um, in some of these test pilots. Uh, and Eric, in particular, I think, had huge amounts of, 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 uh, of courage. One of the things I've discovered about him is that he compartmentized his life. So his son was born in 1948, just, um, just after this, uh, on the 1st of March, um, born prematurely and nearly died. So Lord Hassel, the first ever incubator in Britain, um, would, had just been created. It was flown down from Liverpool, where it was, uh, to Farnborough, where uh, Glenn was, and he was put in, in this, because RAE had an aircraft that could go to Liverpool and pick it up, simple as that. Um, how did Eric get over that? Eight o'clock the next morning, he was off flying. He flew five different types that day, and that would have required somebody to be concentrating. So he shut out that bit in his mind about his son, and of course, Lynn, his wife, was in a pretty bad way. As well, premature baby, etc., etc. Um, and this is Eric's big thing. When he did something like land an aeroplane on the deck, he absolutely did nothing else in his mind. Nothing else was allowed to go anywhere near his mind. And he always had his. He had twelve different things that he would um, record um, uh, to get right before he knew, flew any new aircraft. Um, the first two or three are, are quite. Um, quite standard. You need to know the numbers. You need to know what speed you should be doing over the deck. Not that you're going to look down at the aircraft uh, airspeed indicator, but you're going to feel that. If you're a pilot on your, on your landing, the last thing you're doing actually is looking at the instruments. You're looking out uh, and you need to get that, that feel. Um, the, the stall speed, um, the climb speed, all of these, these things. And for this aircraft, it, it was also the numbers on, on, on the engine. So if you did have to go around again, you know, where can you start going around again? And the other one, which I have taken really to heart, is even when you're in a room or in a car, know your way out, know your means of escape. His big thing, which saved his life several times, we'll come to one of those in a minute, was you need to have two means of escape of anything you do. You need to know how you, for example, eject, or how you digest in the canopy and jump out, or what you do in the event of ditching. And he went through that in his mind. Before he did this landing, they were living in Farnham, um, in, uh, in a cottage in Farnham. And he spent his time, according to his wife, 
hanging upside down in the garage from a beam, getting used to being that way up in case the aircraft ditched, and working out, did he have the muscles to pull himself up? Did he know, could he have been disorientated? Because he did it in the dark. And this is, this is Eric to a T. This is a man who was determined to survive. He really wanted to get to be 100. <coughs> and then there's this idea. Now, who in their right mind would actually spend eight years perfecting the rubber deck? The Brits. I mean, the answer was very simple. Uh, or rather, the, the, the question asked was, how can we make aircraft lighter, jets lighter to operate off small carriers? Because we never, well, until recently, we've never built carriers that are big enough. You know, our light, our light fleets, our fleets, you know, the, the operating scimitars of HMS Centaur was just bonkers. It really, today it wouldn't pass the, the, you know, the governance tests of the, uh, the MAA. But, right, let's put a rubber deck there. Uh, and that means, of course, we're going to have to have rubber decks in every other airfield, uh, aren't we? Because the whole point of this was having airplanes that didn't require undercarriage. So then how are you going to take, take off again? Hmm, that's it. <coughs> hmm. Um, well, we're craning them up and put them on some sort of sleigh. Okay. What's wrong with wheels? You know, it, it is quite bizarre. And of course you're probably aware that they did all sorts of trials for this. Using the Hotspur glider with concrete in it and throwing it onto the deck. Um, they they um, first uh, approach that Eric did to the rubber duck they had at Farnborough. He stuffed, stuffed the nose of the, of the aircraft into the rubber deck. Now there is still alive a, a, a commander engineer, Robinson, who at the time was a sub-lieutenant. And I said to him, this 3rd of November, I said, it's great, wasn't it? And he said, no idea. He said, I was underneath the deck making sure that it all worked. He said, and all we had to do every time Flipping Winkle Brown landed on the deck was re-rig it um, because it always damaged the deck because it was built, of course, across the top uh, of the flight deck. And you just look at this and you go, why would you do that? You know, why, why, why? Um, but, you know, it was yet another thing that Eric did. That They said, go do it, so he did it. But by this time, he, he was in his second tour at the Royal Aircraft Establishment. Now, I find that really interesting because most people who've moved on, you did one tour, three years, and you're back in, into a squadron. That was a little bit of his undoing. He spent so long as a test pilot that when it came to going into the fleet and going into squadrons, he didn't really have that squadron mentality. He'd flown on the squadron, uh, for less than eight months on A202, and he didn't have that, um, that camaraderie, that, that sharing that you, you, you do uh, on a squadron. And what about the one that nearly killed him? I'm actually, about 22 aeroplanes nearly killed him. So, um, but let's talk about this one because this is really interesting. This is yet another brilliant British idea. So, it was. They thought it was very clear. I'm going to have to run and get a mouthful of coffee. It's going to make a noise, okay? Just hang on a sec. Here we go. This is another brilliant British idea. Um, it's very clear that the German research on um, tailless aircraft is working, was working really well in the um, 45. Lipich and a number of the other designers had done a lot of work on this. Look at the, the, one, the 163. This is a jet, measures bit 163, with some refinements to it. Um, it killed more people for, for a type of aeroplane than any other aeroplane. There's only, only one person survived test flying, and that was five, six, five foot six inches um, tall. Eric Brown. Why? Well, first of all, he flew it without a bone dome because nobody had bone domes. But he was short. 
When the aircraft started to oscillate, his head wasn't, he wasn't tall enough for his head to hit the canopy, which happens, for example, Jeffrey de Havilland Jr., who broke his neck when the aircraft went bang. Um, and uh, his head up there, Eric disliked this aeroplane immensely, but was deeply proud of being asked to go and sort it out. Eric was, a, Eric was not an experimental test pilot, he was not an engineering test pilot, he was a handling pilot. He would, if somebody had put wings and an engine on a manhole cover, Eric would have volunteered to see if he could fly it. He loved that whole idea of flying something new and something different. So he was really keen on getting his hands uh, on this, this aeroplane. His successor at Farnborough was killed flying it. Um, Jeffrey de Havilland Jr. was killed flying it. You start to, to look at that, you start saying, do, do we really know what we were doing with these days? 560 test pilots and flight test engineers died between 1943 and 1953. Can you imagine that today? Can you imagine, you know, a, we, we have, you know, an, an easy jet aircraft has a, an engine problem and, and it, it's, it's on the 10 o'clock news. You know, did you know that in, in the 1953 coronation um, fly past, that six pilots died as the aircraft formed up? There were 350 aircraft in the fly past. So I suppose the attrition rate's not bad. Um, there were six aircraft that went down and the pilots died. Can you imagine that happening? So you imagine the 10th of July, we had that magnificent fly past for our AF-100, which I thought was absolutely brilliant. You imagine, you imagine if, if one of those aircraft had, had a problem, it, could, it would have been news. So we were losing people and it was just considered to be part of what happens, part of the game, part of what you do. And Eric was determined that he would not be one of those statistics. He was absolutely determined that he would not be one of those people who died. So he always, always did everything with, with intimate care. Except, of course, that famous time when he picked up a helicopter. Because he thought, it's not difficult to fly a helicopter. Went up to Liverpool, picked up a helicopter, um, to fly back to, to Farnborough. Actually, he was really going to, he was going to go to Andover first, to where the helicopter unit had been established. Um, and thought they'd been instructed to take him through the aircraft, and there wasn't, they had pilot's notes, they read the pilot's notes, um, and he and Martindale flew the aircraft, and just about survived. And in, in a rare piece of Eric Kander, he said, do you know, I realised I actually couldn't do this, I needed to go and get some proper instruction. Now, it's not very often that you get Winkle Brown going, actually, I didn't, do, didn't know what I was doing, which I think is really fascinating. So this aircraft is at a time when we're building really interesting designs. We had the investment in the technologies to go and further flight. We wanted the sound barrier. We, that was the, the holy grail. Everyone wanted to go faster than the speed of sound. Eric was determined to do it, as you know. <coughs> he very much wanted um, to be the first in the world. He very much wanted um, to be the person who was leading the way because he had all of that experience in the German. 53 different German aircraft, including six types of jet or rocket plane. He was absolutely the, uh, the, the right man in the right place. But he didn't like this one. Neither did he like that one. So, here's Eric, it's the 13th of August, I've got to put the date up there. Um, he's technically off charge at midnight on the 12th from Farnborough. So those of you who are military, he didn't have an authoriser. So he goes down, he takes an Avenger, and in those days there was an airfield, or there's a runway at Cowes. Um, it's on the west side. Um, you can still actually see where it was. Um, so he pops in and he lands, lands on and then decides, would it be a really, really good idea um, if he had a go at this? 
Well, I know he was a really good handling test pilot, and I know he'd flown German flying boats, I know he'd flown jets. But this really wasn't a very clever idea. So he hits a piece of wood, the aircraft sinks, and he nearly dies. The aircraft is still there. Um, it's, as those of you know, cows, there, there are two lines where yachts moor for a cow sweep. It's, um, it's in the second line, about halfway along. I can, can't remember the boy number. Um, it's there. Uh, we reckon it's about 250,000 to recover it. If anyone's got that, um, you know, um, there'll be two, because we've already got one in Southampton, of course. Um, this is really interesting to me, is that Eric was prepared. It, this was a sort of almost a... He'd been ordered to leave Farnborough. Eric would have stayed at Farnborough forever if he'd had the opportunity. He loved all this test flight. He loved flying the new aircraft. It really gave him a huge buzz to be the first person up there and doing this flight. Unauthorised flight nearly kills him. Can you imagine that today? It's, you know, it, it's questions in the house time. It's, you know, the Secretary of State perhaps ought to stand down. He did also, he did an awful lot of work um, with sweat wings um, and straight wings. So you've got the P40, P1040, you've got the um, the 52, we've got straight wings, so basically straight wing uh, Seahawk, sweat wing Seahawk, led into the Hunter. Great time, um, he was a goosh uh, mate of Bill Humble, the chief test pilot at Hawker. Um, they spent a lot of time uh, talking together um, about what, you know, where are jets going? How can we, how can we make use of the German technologies uh, and go further? I mean, I, I, you're, you're probably aware that the Vulcan and uh, Concorde uh, wing designs um, owe their origins to the Germans. Um, part of, of what we did uh, in taking German technology. Um, uh, the ejection seat um, is German. The uh, variable thrust uh, nozzles on the Harrier, it's a German idea. Um, there was a lot of work being done um, at Farnborough. Uh, with jets um, and looking at sweat wing, looking at tail configurations. And what happened was the boffins would do the work and then test pilots would get in and fly the aircraft. Now, Eric's got 487 types in his logbook. A lot of the flying he did was five minutes, seven minutes. Nine minutes, I'd take that to be one, <laughs> one or two circuits. So they would, somebody would do a twitch with the aircraft um, and perhaps uh, reconfigure the, tr uh, the, uh, the, uh, the trim tabs and it would go and he'd go circuit and come back and report. Um, there isn't a lot of, uh, in these days, not a lot of long flights because you didn't need to do that. The way that test flying was being done was that the company would test the aircraft, first flight, and get the, test the aircraft, go to Farnborough to look at the aerodynamics and the engineering side of it, and then go to Boscombe Down to um, WAWE um, for the in-service trials, how do we make this aircraft actually work. So Farnborough wasn't doing how do we fight this aeroplane, it's how do we get the best out of this aeroplane. And that's what Eric was really good at, as, as having flown so many times. But interestingly, at the end of his career, he only had a little over 6,000 hours total flying time. Now, that's not a lot. Um, my helicopter flying instructor had 17,000 hours on the Scout. You know, in those days when this is in the 80s, when, when people were doing lots and lots of hours. He was a staff sergeant, so all he did was fly. So Eric didn't have a lot of time, but he had lots of flights, because test flying is about, um, it isn't about how long we spend in the air. His second great opportunity was going to, uh, to Pax River, Patuxent River, and flying there. So he was the first and only 
British exchange test pilot at Pax River. There had been other pilots, but it was a, an exchange based thing. There was an American went to Farnborough, uh, and he went to Pax River. And boy, did he love it. He absolutely adored being in Pax River. So, a um, couple of things to point out here. Um, B-17, which he flew there, um, having done quite a lot of work looking at escort, long-range escort fighters in 43. Um, it wasn't actually until 1951 he got to fly the B-17. The Americans had a different attitude to test flying. Everybody who was a test pilot at PAX flew every aircraft they had and had to be current on all aircraft, which meant they flew all the time. And the, the outstation was Edwards down in California, so there were lots of trips across uh, uh, the states as well. And we'll come on to that in a minute. Um, but I would point that aircraft out there. It's Corsair, we all know that. The, in, here in New Zealand, there's a Corsair. Um, that was the aircraft that test pilots were encouraged to fly at the end of the day to do, go and do aerobatics, just to go fly. They had two of them. And Eric and his mates used to go and do that. And there was one thing I discovered about Eric. He has a bit of a thing about bridges going under them. Chesapeake Bay has a really nice bridge with very wide spans. And on one memorable occasion, with Scott Crossfield, the first American in space, as his number, properly in space, not Earl Shepard, properly in space, um, as his wingman, they go, he, sa he says, I would imagine, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of surmising this, but let's go low level and we go under the bridge. And so Eric goes under the bridge and it's fine. Scott's number two goes under the bridge and the state trooper gets his his tail number. As you can see, um, it's quite, um, quite bold on the side there. Um, Crossfield is up for court martial for low flying and endangering life, etc., etc. America nearly didn't have one of its best astronauts. And uh, Eric did quite a lot to um, get various admirals to come and say, uh, this, men will be men, boys will be boys, you know. Uh, doesn't it show how wonderful our test pilots are with doing this? Um, but he flew all, all the other uh, aircraft that are here um, and hated lots of them. Um, but the Americans were, were very good to him. Uh, here's Scott, sorry, yes, he, of course, quite famous for the X-15. I think he went something like 334,000 feet um, in the aircraft, in the X-15. Um, and of course, the other person he did a lot with was, was Al Shepard as well. Um, these are Navy test pilots, that's why they're at Pax River. Um, Eric was absolutely convinced that it was the US Navy test pilot program that produced the best astronauts. Um, either, uh, they're either Navy or Marine Corps, um, they, they train the same. Um, Eric's boss here uh, was a uh, was a Marine Corps uh, fighter race from Corsairs in the Pacific War. They get on really, really well. There's lots of little interesting pieces. Um, Eric was really quite cut up when he uh, he would, died about um, in the 1990s, I think it was. He was murdered uh, at his home with break-in um, in Oregon. Um, and El Shepard, of course, these, these guys, are all, they've all gone. They've all passed on now. You know, we, we are... You know, we, we, that generation, um, that second great generation of aviators after the First World War, uh, the second, are all very fast disappearing. Um, the first time we went to supersonic wasn't until 1952. You'll notice that I've missed out the, the M52 project, and there's a reason for that, um, because I don't want yet, till the book comes out, to reveal what I know about it. So. Please accept that. Um, how do you celebrate going supersonic for the first time? You go low level across the airfield and you cause a sonic boom which destroys the Admiral's greenhouse. <laughs> so, so the greenhouse is destroyed, you land on, and it's you know, Lieutenant Commander Brown to report to 
the apple, or whatever the American pipe would be from that. Um, result? A $10 fine, because that was the highest amount he could be fined for the for the uh, uh, the greenhouse. And then off to the O Club, the officers club, um, for a drink afterwards. Um, because he just got, and that was actually the aircraft um, that he went uh, supersonic in. They had sabers there. Um, the Americans, if you remember, were developing the Fury, the, the sort of naval version. Actually, the test pilots all preferred the saber, uh, particularly the, um, uh, the, uh, the B and Cs, and eventually the Ds, the, the dog with the, uh, the radar on. Um, and you've got Panthers and Cougars. So he flew all of those, but not for very long. Again, um, the, there aren't great long flights in his logbook. There are, they're very short flights. They're no more than an hour um, of, of each of them. But they were flying aircraft, five different aircraft a day, from props to B-17s to flying boats to jets. There was, there was, there was the authorization process seemed to me to be so much more simple uh, than, it is, uh, than it is today. Oops. Then he gets to go uh, to Edwards. Edwards at this time was the most secret place in America other than uh, Los Alamos and the nuclear uh, program. It had all the interesting technologies there. Um, Eric actually drove there um, across America he found somebody who had left his car behind and he just packed the family up and they drove to Edwards. Um, he's a great man for any opportunity um, to, to do something different. Um, and this is um, uh, Chuck Yeager, uh, who tweeted on Eric's death, um, Eric Brown, who's he? Never heard of him. Um, they didn't get on very well. First of all, He's an Air Force officer. Secondly, he wasn't the most reliable person to have with you in an aeroplane. Eric and he did a, a cross-country flight where he fell asleep and claimed it was Eric who fell asleep. Um, I'm on Eric's side. I, you know, he's the Brit. He's the naval officer. Um, but he was having an affair with Pancho. And um, she had the ranch hotel, um, which was a sort of bordello-ish sort of place, um, but good beer, excellent steaks, um, and right next to Edwards. And for some reason, it sort of had security clearance. You could go there and talk about what you've been doing all day, because of course it was a bar, and you know. There were no Russians going to be there, so it was okay, you could crack on uh, uh, and do it. Um, Eric said he'd seen a large number of ugly women in his life. You know the next bit is, don't you? But she took the biscuit. Um, and that picture was taken, by the way, in 1925. Um, she's no mean uh, Ingatrix. I mean, this is a person who did lots and lots of flying in, in, uh, before the war. Um, and barnstorming, and was uh, a very good aerobatic pilot, uh, etc. Um, and that's the, the ranch is still there. Um, it burned down. Um, uh, there was an there was a problem with tax and, and payments, and uh, the insurance was worth more when the place burned down than, than the bills. You know, who knows? <coughs> but he did get to fly some interesting aeroplanes. But he didn't, at that stage, get to meet Neil Armstrong. He didn't meet Neil until he'd finished in the Royal Navy. But at that time, when he was at Edwards, he had, didn't realize it, that he had applied to fly the X-15. The Brits said, it would be really good to get a Brit into that aircraft. And the Americans said, yep, you've got one guy we will take, and that's Eric Brown. But he'll have to become an American citizen. And Eric said, that's a step too far, even to fly the most brilliant aeroplane in the world. I, I'm not going to become an American. I, you know, I'm, I'm a Scot, I'm a Brit. Um, Eric had very firm views on this. There is the United Kingdom, Scotland is part of it. 
He also has a view, had a view about uh, Germany, uh, the Fourth Reich, and the European Union. And you can probably guess what he <laughs> would have voted if he'd lived, okay? Um, he didn't meet Neil until 19, 1971. Um, and uh, it was all uh, because of the Land Rover. Uh, and all because it was Bedford, it was a Sunday afternoon, Eric was flying a Wessex doing some approaches to look at a, um, a precision approach indicator for oil rigs, because by this time he was at the British Helicopter Advisory Board, the North Sea was just opening, and um, uh, Neil Armstrong was over flying the HP-115 Delta Wing aircraft, and they got on like a house on fire. Um, I remember asking Eric, did you, did, were you not jealous of Neil Armstrong going to the moon? Because, you know, you, you, you didn't get this first supersonic, so what about the moon? And he went, an IBM computer flew to the moon. Neil Armstrong sat in the seat, and it wasn't until the, that landing where the test pilot, you, you're probably all aware that they had to skip the boulder field. Um, if it hadn't been a test pilot who could do the mental arithmetic for, um, for you know, how much fuel have I got and where can I go with this three seconds of fuel sort of thing, um, they, they go on like a house on fire. Um, and every time that Neil came to, to the UK, um, there was there's an interesting story, which I'm, I'm, I'm not sure it's going to be in the book, but it's um, NASA ran out of money, as you're probably aware, um, and uh, Neil Armstrong and a whole bunch of astronauts went to the Saudis to see if they'd get some money. Because where else do you go but the Saudis for money? Um, and they came back to London. And Eric got a telephone call, which was, uh, paraphrasing, it was something like, Captain Brown, could you be available if an embassy car came and collected you in two hours' time? So, gets into the uh, embassy car, I'm thinking, what's the American thing? I suppose I have to trust them. Had it been the French, it might have been a different matter. Um, gets into the car, goes up to London, um, goes to a really nice restaurant in Davis Street, gets out of the car, the door is opened by uh, a full colonel who salutes him in uniform, salutes him and says, will you follow me, sir? And he's thinking, this is interesting. Goes into a, into a private room in the dining room, and there are all the astronauts. There's, there is um, Neil Armstrong. There's also a whole bunch of Brit, uh, famous Brit people as well. It's just, uh, it's very typical. They all wanted to see Eric. They all wanted to see Winkle. They were in London. Hey, he's only 50 miles away. Let's, let's, let's go get him and, and, and bring him up. This is the... the um, the other one that got away, he was really, really glad about this. Have you, any of you heard of the Bolton Paul P11-111? Yeah? Probably like it too. Painted yellow? Um, most appalling looking. It looks to me like somebody has seen a picture of, uh, what's the whale that, um, that just sits and whale, goes, goes around? And it looks like a whale, doesn't it? One of those benign whales. Uh, not whales, sorry. Um, sharks. Um, Eric could not resist trying to get involved uh, in this aircraft, trying to find a way of, um, of flying it. Hey, because it was another time. Uh, but he didn't. But he did go and command a squadron, commanded 804 at Lossing on Seahawks. He was the only commander, as opposed to lieutenant commander, um, uh, as the CEO of a Navy squadron at Lossy at the time, which meant he was the same rank as Commander Air, uh, his regulator. Which is probably why he was short toward as the squadron commander. But he did manage to achieve this. And what I don't have is the photograph of 802 squadron spoiling that. Um, so they were going to do this for a visit um, of the Queen in Britannia to Scotland. She was coming up in Moray Firth. And they were going to do this, this wonderful formation, which I know the Royal Air Force had put 60 hunters up, or 150 hunters, or, or whatever, as, as the Air Force had got lots of aeroplanes. Um, but this was, this was pretty good for the Navy to do. He said 802 Squadron decided they didn't really like this. Um, they were fed up with 804 um, being 
cock a hoop about it. So they had two aircraft in the cloud above when they were doing this practice. Um, there was um, the uh, station commander, the Rear Admiral Fleet Air Arm, who at that time would have been called FONAC, I think, Flag Officer the Naval Air Command, there, and an 802 Seahawk comes at the back there, uh, but the other way around. So there, there they are, going over like that, and someone is bunting over the top, which completely destroys the formation. Aircraft scatter everywhere. Last year, I found out the name of the sub-lieutenant who did that, and it, 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 I knew that everybody knew about it on 802 Squadron. And Brian Ellis, Shlou Ellis, um, who did the shoot down of the uh, of the MiG in, in Korea, um, and had had been um, on 802 as a as a, uh, uh, a flight commander. Uh, he said, well, he's, "I suppose he's dead now, so I can tell you. I won't tell you his name. It's in the book." Um, uh, and it, it was just so typical of the, the, this was Eric's big problem. He spent so long being a solo operator. When it came to running a squadron and being in a squadron, even the senior pilot on, on the CEO uh, Fury Squadron, he didn't have that, that leadership quality. So his, his 206, his confidential report on the Sea Fury Squadron, gave him four out of nine, for some reason the Navy does nines, four out of nine for leadership. He was still getting four out of nine here. Um, everything else was nine out of nine. But it's the leadership bit. He just wasn't good as a team, team player. He should have stayed as being a test pilot. Um, he also managed to talk his way into this, completely unauthorized, and fly with prone meteor. Um, you know, who in their right mind is going to want to sit up there? He thought it was rather nice. He said it was incredibly comfortable. I'm uh, just laying down and, and doing, doing aerobatics. Um, you know, and who's to say he's wrong? Um, it nearly killed him again because, of course, um, Eric just took it just a bit beyond the envelope, as, as you would do if you're a test pilot. I just want to see what does happen if I'm there. Um, I, th I find that. Uh, Absolutely fascinating. I find it fascinating we do that as well. So many things we did. I, I don't know, would I like to have been around at that time? You know, would I like to be perhaps in my 40s and in the 1950s watching all of these developments? Not, not sure. Can you imagine? Today we just don't do anything like that. Everything is so incredibly orchestrated. In 67, he was the naval attaché in Bonn. And the Luftwaffe and the Molina Fieger had just acquired the 104. He had tried really hard when he was Deputy Director of Naval Air Warfare and gave the Germans to buy um, a, a British combination rocket um, uh, jet aircraft made by Saunders Road. Um, any idea how many German aircrew were lost in starfighters? More than 210. Um, why? Because this was an aircraft designed to high level interception um, from nice sunny California uh, of Russian bombers. The Germans used it as a low level attack aircraft. When they first had them, the ejection seat only worked one way down. And it was just bizarre. Eric. Eric's logbook, um, I think I, I, I can remember correctly, it, it, it puts the serial number of the aircraft, um, and he was flying, um, not as PFC, but flying uh, with um, uh, an instructor, and then flew, uh, changed seats and flew in the front. And his view on this, a real shocker. Um, he was so delighted the Brits uh, didn't go for it. And we're getting to the stage now where Eric is starting to stop flying. Um, when you're station commander of a naval air station, um, you've got a lot of admin, admin to do. It isn't like it, you know, when you're a squadron commander, you can go, or even, actually even better, senior pilot, where you can just go and fly. You work out the flying program, so you stick yourself in it. Um, and when it comes to flying the, the, the jets of the time, 
actually, there's a real problem. Um, you need to do the course. It isn't like the war where you just got into one aircraft after another. So, Eric never flew the F4K Phantom, the Brit one. He was responsible for creating the, uh, this is because our carriers are too small. You have to give it a, an angle of approach, uh, a sort of an angle of attack rather than takeoff. The only Phantom he flew, he did two sorties in this F4K. Jay, I think it is, from Saratoga. Um, and that's when he flew the fastest. Uh, and indicated Mach 2.65, which almost probably took the bloody wings off the aircraft, to be honest. And, um, and did the deck landing. The Americans seem to have a different view about authorizations. Um, uh, I find it really interesting because it's through Eric that the Navy got the Phantom. As Deputy Director of Naval Air Warfare responsible for procurement, he's the guy who pushed and pushed and pushed and took the minister to St. Louis, to McDonald, to look at the Phantom and said, this is what we will have. And then was so dismayed, it took another three years to get into service because we had to put Rolls-Royce engines in it. So what did that do? It decreased the range, increased the weight, and made the aircraft far more difficult to repair because Guess what? It hadn't been designed for those engines. So we did a lot of really silly things like that uh, at the time, which really frustrated him. So the last aircraft that Eric flew in service was the Whirlwind 7 helicopter on his last day at La Cibale, and he crashed it. <laughs> so there but for the grace of God go so many of us um, in terms of our, of our flying careers, I think. All of that, to me, still means that Eric was our greatest pilot, possibly the world's greatest pilot. If you look at what he achieved, his Guinness Book of Records, all of the things that, that he did, I think he's still a remarkable man. You, if you were in the fleet air arm at the time, you probably have a view that view is either on the I like Marmite or I don't like Marmite. There are very few people of the time who are in the middle when it comes to, to Eric Melrose Brown. I still think he was our greatest pilot. I think he was a fantastic operator and he was a great storyteller. One of the key things that I thought was so good about him is when he was in hospital, in 1906, uh, 19, uh, 2006, the, um, the first thing he asked me to do was go home to his house, get his diary, and ring everybody up and say he wasn't feeling very well, but he'd be okay after Easter. And so he would get back in the diary of all the societies that he was patron of, president of, vice president, or, or whatever, because he rarely would let anybody down because he was of that generation where you didn't do it. Ladies and gentlemen, Winkle Brown, our greatest pilot.